Hey, it's John McBride, Rocky Mountain Unmanned Systems, RMUS. Uh, we're gonna be discussing the X-T2 in this video. Um, a little bit of configuration and how it's set up, uh, different configurations you can do as far as the device that we're gonna be using, and then as well as just settings on this app that, that uh, we'll show you and kind of guide you through a little bit. Um, this isn't much different than the FLIR Duo Pro R. Uh, this, the similarities are very close, but the configurations are quite different. But as far as ability to get this set up, the hardware side, and we've got an M600 Pro here, we have the Z30 mount, and that's what uh, DJI calls that, even though that we are using the same connection for the Z30 mount. So if you have an X3, X5 mount, you will have to purchase a Z30 mount in order to use the X-T2. So the, um, this has already come into question a couple of times of whether the X-T2, or this, this mount and the adapter would be able to work with a standard X-T, or the Z3 or the X3, it will not. So we've tried that, we've tested that, it doesn't work very well or, or doesn't work at all. The firmware software is not there. But in order to do this, again, M600, we've got the, the Z30 mount and the X-T2 sitting here. On the radio system, we're running a Crystal Sky, but if we wanted to use this X-T2, we could use the actual iPad if we wanted to. Um, that's traditionally what we use when we're flying the M600, but you do have to use the X-T Pro app in order for this to work. So just letting you know, the iPad can work. It's not really meant, the X-T2, or the, I'm sorry, the X-T Pro app is not really intended to be used for the inspection purposes or anything like that. It's really meant for the public service guys on, on use. Um, another one thing is that it doesn't uh, track the flights um, specifically within the app. So just one of those things to consider. So it will work with an iPad, but for today, we're gonna go ahead and use and show you how it's gonna work with the Crystal Sky. So if we just open up in manual flight, down there on the bottom, it's populated as the X-T2. And we have a image here that's a thermal image. I'm gonna go ahead and close the map here, get rid of it. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to kill the image there, but let's close this down so we don't show that as much. Give us a little bit more field of view. Uh, the advanced, we have the advanced uh, radiometric version. I mean, that, or not advanced radiometric version, but this is radiometric. So we have the ability to see um, basically thermal with temperature sensing here. And we're more than capable of seeing that uh, in, in the selection of where we touch on the screen. So depending on where we touch on the screen, we'll show a temperature difference. And I'm just gonna rotate the camera just a little bit to the right so we're looking at something a little bit cooler like our filming guy, Jace, over there. And we'll use, cause he's got a little bit better backdrop than my, my body. So um, up here on the top right, you can see, like I said, I can touch and I can spe specifically choose on this version, the temperature data, wherever I want that. Uh, I can also, with the spot meter, change the spot meter up here on the top. We can then get a high-low spot of temperature. So I can make that box as big as I want with touch screen. And what you're seeing right now is the hottest spot, and that's being indicated on the bottom, bottom of the screen, is the hottest pot, spot that it's sensing and then the coolest spot that it's sensing. And we can see the temperature changes. The little red thing that's showing up on the bottom, the temperature alarm, we can set an alarm there on this little box feature and actually have an alarm go off that allows us to hit a high temperature um, that, that indicates, hey, you're hitting it. So that's the box feature. And then one more click on the top, it will make the actual spot meter go away. So three selections there on the spot meter. FCC, that's the flat field correction. We see this occasionally when we're doing video, if we touch that right there, that FFC, we can see it kind of pause for a second. And I'm gonna put my hand in here and move as we're moving. We can see this pause for a second when we do that action. What that did, flat field correction is doing is just calibrating the sensor, and that's, that's what it's initially doing. But that calibration can sometimes, when we're getting a trigger fire on the camera, and it does it on its own, um, when it sees a, a major difference in temperature, uh, it will do that. And, and that's what that, that clicking noise in the camera is, as well as the um, pausing in the, in the camera feed. This does have um, digital zoom. On the 640 versions, you have up to eight. So we'll go over here to his face right there. That's times two, there's times four, and times four. <laughs> 
On the 336 versions, we have times four, we have times eight on the 640s. Um, then on the uh, MSX button, I mean, that is how the, the view is gonna come through. And since we're just gonna stay on the thermal, if, I, if we are currently on MSX being selected, but if I turn on the actual MSX itself, then we'll put that on the low, we can see the outline of Jace's, uh, the camera. It's doing a mix of the RGB camera as well as the thermal camera together. So one of the things, like I said, what we, what we notice, and let me just kind of get it backed off here. What we notice is on, on Jace's alignment with his head, headphones, we don't quite see that shining light coming off because it's not mixing. So there's the on and off, and we can see that. But in order to choose that to line up a little bit better, the parallax has to be adjusted. So we have a plus or minus where it moves that parallax up or down. We'll try to align it to a certain point and then left and right. And so if I come right just a little bit more, we can see it gets off alignment and then back up and hits the alignment. So depending on, depending on exactly how, we, how the parallax might affect how far away distance is, that's the most important thing. Your distance is where the parallax of the two cameras will mesh to, together, creating the awesome MSX feature. Uh, we can select mid or high, depending on how much blending we have, and look how much more, it just I have it offset really bad so you can see the difference of where it is. But if I move it again a little bit closer, this allows us to see things like on his shirt right there, I can actually read his shirt. And if I turn the MSX off, I cannot see his shirt. And that's that blending of RGB as well as thermal together. Some of the other things that we have here is again, we can choose as we come out, there's our visible camera portion. And then we also have an optical zoom there. So we can see that works up to times eight. Digital. D digital, digital. And then we go into a picture in picture kind of thing. In order to get the picture in picture, we also have an alignment there that we can, we can set up so we can move the alignment. If it doesn't quite line up with his arms or whatever, I can move the picture around to get the best parallax of those two images together. And I can set that number or there, those, those uh, relative numbers there to align the picture the best I can, depending on distance. And then I can choose where I want the actual, whether I want to do picture in picture on the left and the left is set up right now. We'll go into a little bit more settings here, or I can do half and half, or I can do again, middle of the thermal picture. When I go into the menu settings here, I have a lot of things I can choose what I can do with the camera. First one with the camera on the, on the left side here is the photo mode. So what is, it, what is it gonna do when I choose whatever, however, when I press the shutter button, what is it gonna do? If it's gonna do a single shot, burst shot, or an interval shot. Uh, we can do that interval shot if we're doing any type of mapping, if we're doing any type of triggering like that, that's just automated the interval. We can choose how many seconds it'll actually fire and the camera does that automatically. It doesn't need to be told by a mapping system to do so. The uh, image format. So what type of file? We did an earlier video of this between the differences between JPEG, TIFF and radiometric JPEG. Um, you can check that out in, uh, in some of the videos that we have on YouTube, the differences between those. But for the most part, we're going to be using radiometric JPEG. And then those are the settings in the camera stuff. So let me change this uh, back to the single shot. If we go into the video settings, video settings themselves, I have an MP4 I can choose, MOV, and a couple of new file types here called the TIFF sequential and the SEQ file. Um, these are a, a radiometric video file. So it's almost like raw video, but it's not quite, it's done on radiometric. So they, instead of doing an MOV file that creates one solid whole file, if you can read sequential files, that is basically 30 frames per second that it's taking and re remembering those images one at a time so that you can review those if you know how to read sequential files as individual radiometric images. It's basically a series of images. That's correct. Series of images all put together that you can then separate if you wanted to, to look at an individual file. Um, on the uh, video portion as well, that's again, different file types we can choose. Most of the time I'm using MOV or MP4, but that's what I'm using. Then on the visible side, we can see the selections here. We can do 4K or 1080. 
at 30 frames per second. And we have the video format as well. What does the, the RGB video format? Do we want it in MOV or MP4? On the settings side, uh, the video caption on and off, that's actually a, a, um, a, a oh, SLQ file that, that is created when you do your video. So the SLQ file has some connotation annotations that actually are embedded. If you know, again, how to use an SLQ, this is how to turn that on and off. Anti-flicker, um, same thing, that's exactly what that is to try to keep the props from doing any kind of flickering coming through the actual um, uh, recording. And that's the other interesting part is the, is the PIP setting. So you can define where the PIP is going to be, right top, center, bottom. But then when we come back out and we choose basically where that is, we can see this is just changed. And I can select again these three. So it depends on the three I want to do. But right now it's indicating that if I select on that, it's at the, at the bottom center. I can then change that real quick to PIP center to the right top. It changes it, and then depending on which one of these do I do, that's where the setting is. So in order to change where you want the picture in picture, that is where that does that. So we'll put it on the left top there. ROI, uh, we can go a lot into the actual thermal side of settings, but I really just kind of wanted to show you that these are very similar to what they're already out there with the XT, but ROI is your range of interest. The scene, whether uh, how you want the thermal camera to act in different conditions. These are just preset numbers in the uh, camera itself. And then we can define uh, certain types of settings if no matter what we want to do and just come back to those default settings or those setup user settings if you wanted to. Isotherm is still on or capable. So if we turn on the isotherm, it actually changes the way that the thermal images goes. So I'm going to change it over here to our full thermal image. And the isotherms will change the way the representation happens and depending on how we set up the um, actual search for people. So we can see how much highlighted Jace is right now because it's set for a temperature range of a high end of 105, a low end of 80. So his uh, temperature range, it's showing really highlighted a contrasted color. Even my hand is very high contrast. But if we turn the isotherm off, we're right back to a normal color palette that we, that we uh, typically use. 90% of the time, people have the isotherm turned on and then when they change the color palettes, and we'll just do that just so I can demonstrate how that looks. When I change the color palette, so right now we're on fusion, I'm gonna do black hot, I'm gonna do white hot, and we can see that the color of the white hot, black hot, and rainbow, all of these are the isotherm, because it's turned on, is trying to highlight and contrast only those. But if we turn it on rainbow, this is the way the rainbow looks, but if we turn the isotherm off, come back here to isotherm, turn it off, that's what the color palette typically looks like. Here we have the temperature alert, if we want to turn that on and off, and the threshold that we choose, if we want whatever we want to choose. Uh, gain, this is actually a pretty interesting one, the gain, uh, gain mode. If we're getting into, well, we'll watch Jace change here. Right now, it's likely in the high gain, even though it's set to auto. So even if it is in the high gain, we don't see much change because of the temperature values between negative 13 and 212. But watch what happens when we actually change it to the low gain. Once the low gain goes, it kind of mutes out all of the rest of it because it's looking for the highest temperature range. So it's, it's lost a little bit of the, the resolution, if you will, of temperature on this setting. So if we come back to high, then we can see a lot of different color values and representation because of this gain mode. So that's basically changing our range for you thermal guys. Uh, the external par parameters, again, because it's radiometric, we can change different things in the camera settings here. We can go through and change our Emissivity values, our reflective temperature values, our atmospheric, our atmospheric temperature. We can, we can change a number of things that, that is then retained on the actual radiometric image um, when the picture is taken. FFC settings, if we want that to, we talked about doing the flat field correction, it does it automatically, or do we want to manually trigger it 
and that's the only time. We can actually turn that off so that it doesn't interrupt, maybe, maybe flow, but I don't recommend it. It's very not recommended that you do this. Uh, the camera can easily uh, go way out of, you'll see things that just don't represent good thermal imagery when you leave the FFC, uh, turn the FFC off, but if needed, you, can, you have the choice to do it. So again, on the very bottom uh, of, the, of the settings, we have the reset camera, format SD card number one, SD card number two, and we see the version of camera this is. It is a 336 30 hertz, hence the reason I was only able to get a four times zoom instead of an eight times zoom. So if it's a 640, you can go up to eight times zoom. Uh, the SD cards, that's, uh, there's two of them. So with, with here, we can format them if we want to. Select to do that. It will confirm once the, once the format is done. And when we do, it's kind of an interesting thing about the way the files save on the X-T2. So the X-T2, when you take a single image on one SD card, it will actually create two separate files, an RGB and a thermal image. Um, when we do video, it does the same. A video file in RGB and a video file in thermal. When we do TIFF sequential files or the SEQ files, those are saved on the other SD card. So even though you may not ever do those SEQs, that's what the other SD card is for, so that it'll save those other different file types. Um, as far as the rest of the configurations, it's fairly simple. I mean, that's basically how the X-T2 is operating. There has been, there are some differences between putting the X-T2 on an M600 and sticking it on an M200 or 210 and one of those, uh, the 200 series. So um, join us for the next video and we'll show you some of those, those differences. But, uh, for the most part, the X-T2 works really well on the M600. We're pretty excited about this product, and uh, uh, let us know if you have any questions.